You're listening to episode 84 of Lifestyle Locker Radio with Dr. Marisol Tajero. The digestion is so regulated by the nervous system. This is what I, I always say to all my patients that, you know, digestion isn't about only, you know, breakdown of food, absorption, elimination, but it's actually how we digest our life. So digestion and our, our stools and our gases all correlate to the amount of stress that we have in our system. Hi, I'm Dr. Josh Hand, and welcome to the Lifestyle Locker Radio, where we dive into what makes an awesome lifestyle. From relationships to money mindset, nutrition to fitness, emotional health to peak performance, we bring you on an amazing journey to unleashing your human potential. So here's a little bit about our guest today, Dr. Marisol. She's a naturopathic doctor. She's a world leader renowned for her passion for cleansing and gut health. Not only because she has a degree on the wall, but more so because she's experienced feeling shitty and figured out the hierarchy on how to get healthy. She's been crowned the Queen of Thrones. For over 15 years, she has trained and educated healthcare practitioners and helped thousands of patients transition from shit show to owning their throne. Dr. Marisol is the director and practices at Sanus Health Practice in Canada. She has spearheaded Pure Sanus Health Supplements and invented the Queen of Thrones Organic Castor Oil Pack. The launch of her first book, Oh Shit, her educational conferences and programs heralds her championing you to become your legend. Join her movement and help her to achieve her goal of being in 1 billion bathrooms by 2020. We can do it. So here's our guest today, Dr. Marisol. Okay, everyone, we have Dr. Marisol here, the Queen of Thrones. We are actually going to be talking about some of my favorite things, farting and poop. Well, maybe not really, but they are important things, and they're actually, they are healthy things to understand about both of these. So welcome to, welcome to Lifestyle Locker Radio. So, well, all I have to say is that really our stools say so much about our, our bodies and our state of health. And many of us are so shy and scared to talk about it. And it really should be something that is spoken about at the dinner table. You know, uh, Josh, when I was a kid, my mother was so open. I'm uh, half Latin from Latin America and half from Spain. My mother is so open about the stools. And we, we, we would be checking each other's poos out in the toilets. You know, my mother would achieve a big uh, a big turd. And she'd be like, Maddie, slow, come back. Come back. You know, and like to me, it was okay. I see it's sinking. This is what the stool is doing. So we always had a really open conversation in our home. But then I noticed that as we went outside of the home, people weren't as open to talk about poop. And I noticed that mostly in my practice as well, too, that people would really shy when I would ask those important questions about, you know, how are you going to the bathroom? And, you know, do you toot? Right. These are important things to tell our tell us what our body's doing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I have to I have to full disclosure. I was talking to my wife. This is, I mean, maybe a couple of weeks ago when, when we actually started our conversation, we were in a car or drive where we were driving from. And she's like, I'm like, I got to think of other things I need to do. I want, I want a couple new topics on the podcast. And, and she's like, why don't you do something on farting? I'm like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> done. And that's how, that's how we, I put it online. And that was it. I was just dying. I'm like, and I told her, I'm like, I believe it or not, I'm doing one on farting. She's like, no, you're not. I go, you'll see. It's going to be good. So, so, so Marisol, give us, give us your story because you have a, a neat background, kind of how you became the queen of thrones as your, as your patients yeah. W. Absolutely. So for me, um, my whole background in natural medicine all began uh, with starting with working with a company that was focused on cleansing. And of course, the main main staple of cleansing is making sure those bowels are moving properly. My whole lifetime as a child growing up, like, yes, we were open about our poop at home, but we also suffered a lot with constipation. My mother was definitely in the, in the spectrum of irritable bowel. And then myself, as I got older, I would have constipation, I'd have diarrhea, I'd go back and forth. It all depended on my mood, right? So in practice, of course, when my main focus was to get people's bowels working really awesomely and a way to do that was to work through cleansing 
And yeah, at my clinic, you know, we focus on colon hydrotherapy, which is where people do a treatment that actually cleans and washes out their bowels. We also do things like castor oil packs, which are a big, big eclectic naturopathic therapy that makes a bowel move. And I'm, I'm known as like the legend of the castor oil packs. Like I know everything about these, <laughs> these treatments that makes people's bowels move. I know. So then my, my, my patients more and more used to be like, man, like you're like the queen of thrones. And I'm like, Hey, I love this. <laughs> I'm totally a queen. I will totally take that name. You know, I have a past history of also being like a pageant queen. So I'm like, why not? You know, if anyone can talk about pooping and farting, I, one of my superhero powers is that I, I have the gift of making it humorous and the gift of making, you know, things that are dirty secrets that no one wants to talk about, um, open and funny and, and, and ac- accessible. Right. I think yeah. it's so important. It, it, it's kind of it's it's crazy, but it's I mean, I, I, it's such an important topic because you talk about like digestion is, is the is the pre <laughs> is the pre version of what's going to come out. So that gut yeah. health and right. I mean, yeah, and every, everyone's always talking about the you know, the microbiome, fix your microbiome. But, you know, I don't often hear people talking about, well, what's going on with your poo, you know, yeah. and it's like. We sometimes, yeah, we don't need really fancy, fancy. I mean, we need fancy, fancy tests, but at home on our own, all of us can be our own best doctors and we can be going every time we go to the bathroom, you know, seeing what we're leaving, right? Whatever present we leave, you know, that makes a big difference in terms of like how healthy we are or the foods that we just ate. Like, are they good for us? It tells us every, so much about what we need to know for our own health that we really, it's time to honor, you know, when we sit on that throne, what it is that we, we, we create, right? Like, what are we doing in this world, right? What's our, yeah, our process? Totally, here? totally. Yeah. So when you, when you started getting into, you got like, you're starting to get into like the cleansing world. Um, yeah. I mean, with your degree and kind of creating a, a practice, did you jump right into practice? I didn't ask you that right out of school. Yeah. Well, I asked. What happened is that in third year, I actually invented a castor oil pack, like a way to do a castor oil pack easily, so a compress. And so I actually ended up launching that and and, uh, bringing it to health food stores, um, educating people about castor oil packs. So I kind of started there, but then I jumped right into practice and I kind of had, I put that a little bit on the the back burner, still was distributing and, you know, going to teach people about castor oil packs. But then I jumped into practice and I, I literally started with two days. And within, you know, three months, I was full time booked and I had a wait list for three months just because I'm I because I focus so heavily on getting people's bowels working well and on the basics and really getting, you know, that digestion set that I just had really good clinical results. I was super lucky. And then, you know, cleansing was easy. It was just like, that's what I love. That's what I love talking about. I love making sure people understand what's going on with their body. So it wasn't it wasn't a hardship. That was for sure. Easy, nice and easy. Okay, that's pretty neat. That's, that's yeah. good to hear. I mean, you, you kind of found your niche right, like while you were in school, which I don't really hear many people. They usually go through some crazy story, whether it's you know heartache or whatever it may be, and then they find their passion. You kind of did that while in school. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, what was inter- it was the funny thing though is that I really did. I I I knew my area of niche. But I really didn't know my main focal point. And it really wasn't until like years later, probably about two or three years ago, where, you know, patients started saying these things to me. And, you know, people who know you, my patients have known me for, you know, eight, nine years. Like, they know me well, right? They know my humor. They know my personality. You know, I'm always coming up with things for them. And, you know, they were the ones who really pointed out my superpowers. They were like, wow, you, you do this really well and you do that really well. And I'm like, you know what? Those are the things I really love talking about. Like, I love giving a good conference about, like, how long your poop should be, like, from here to here, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I, I love it. It's, like, so much fun for me. And I, I you know, and ultimately it's this, is that laughter is one of the best medicines. And, yeah. you know, if, if, if we can infuse in our medicine and, it, you know, as we teach people who are trying to, whether they're trying to biohack or they're trying to, you know, live that ultimate life or whatever they're trying to do, if we can infuse laughter and humor into that, oh my gosh, you know, like researchers have tried with laughter to actually um, see if they can find a specific gene or a specific part of the brain that lights up with laughter, but there isn't, right? It's a whole body phenomena. And I always like to say, you know, when you when you have laughter, what, what's a belly laugh? A belly laugh is one of those belly laughs that actually moves your whole body and moves your bowels too, right? So laughter can yeah, actually help enough. us with our digestion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's right? 
Yeah. yeah, this is pretty neat. So, like, we're let's dive. We'll dive into the poop and the stuff in a second. But I think it's neat. What you mentioned laughter. I mean, I, I don't know how you could be it if you're. I can just picture you right now in a conference room, you know, with maybe the hundreds of of other physicians or people or whatever, <laughs> and you put up on like the slide like this poop. I mean, how who's not going to laugh? I mean, I mean, unless you get some real stiffs yeah. in a room. But I mean, it's like the conversation will start with a smile, which I think is actually pretty neat. I didn't know the conversation was going to go in this direction, but. Um, but let's get into, let's get into the farting into the poop and kind of talk a little bit about it because, uh, you know, we all do these things. How do we know what's healthy? How do we know it's not healthy? You know, I, and I I, like it (laughs) talked like women and it's like, Oh, I don't fart. I'm like, really? Come on. I'm calling bull crap on that one. You come on. Really? No, you're human, right? Where the hell does it go? (laughs) Type of thing. Yeah. But exactly. so what makes it, what, is a fart, is a fart good? Is a fart bad? Or does it depend? So this, yeah, so it really, it, it really depends on the entire digestive tract and how it's actually working, right? Farts are normal because they're, it's gas, that gas, and if you really think about it, what our guts are, is they're a big, huge uh, fermentation uh, tank, right? Because mm-hmm. you basically take, you take food in you, you break it down, right? You try to digest it, then you'll absorb it, and then you'll have to eliminate it, right? But along the lines, you know, there's all these bacteria, there's all these yeasts that are, are, you know, working on the food as well, too, and what the leftovers are. Now, what happens with people who have, like, high levels of overgrowths of yeast or overgrowths of, you know, bad bacteria is they tend to actually have higher levels of gas and higher levels of farting, right? Okay. So someone with candida... Candida or yeast as an example, because they actually, whenever they eat high foods that are high on the glycemic index or fruits or lots of sugars, what will happen is the yeast mixed with the sugar um, will sit in their digestive tract and actually start to ferment and actually make alcohol as a byproduct, aldehydes. So okay. these people actually end up, yeah, they end up having like symptoms of hangover, like they're foggy brained, um, they're exhausted, they don't feel motivated. And this is because they have high levels of yeast. And then they, the symptoms that they'll have will be a lot of gas, a lot of bloating, and they'll burp a lot as well too, right? Because okay. they're a little fermentation. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So that, that's one. Um, another example is when uh, people are having those really stenchy, like bad smelling farts, like they clear the room, yeah, right? Yeah. They're, you're like, mm-hmm. oh my God, or, or <laughs> hopefully you're not like, the paint of that on the airplane and it's like a closed environment and oh, someone it. does it in the seat. And it recirculating. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, those kinds of things happen after holidays because, you know, you've eaten different foods and lots of times on holidays, people start to eat different proteins and they might get exposed to bad bacteria when they're on holidays. And these, when proteins are mal digested and they're not digested well, or if they have and they have the bad bacteria at the lo- lower colon, what ends up happening is that the the sulfur components really start to sink up the, the gas. So then mm. you get really bad smelling parts. So that's a sign of protein malabsorption and bad, bad, bad gut bacteria. Okay. Neat, eh? does, yeah. yeah. So does that that's mean, kinda... you know, uh, I'm just trying to think like, so if someone's eating like a steak or something or a, like, a, like I think protein, I'm thinking steak in my head. Um, and they don't process it well. Is it, is it the quality of the food or is it the digestive tract or is it both? It's uh, likely more, more, more often than not, it's their digestive tract. Like they're low in stomach acid. And so they don't, they don't have the, enough of the fire of the acid to be able to break down the protein in the upper portions of the digestion. Uh-huh. So that by the time that it gets to the lower descending colon, you still have protein matter there, which you really shouldn't. And that's ah, okay. what those bad bacteria ah, okay. thrive on, right? So it's a, it's a combination, definitely, but more so specifically that your digestion isn't quite right. So that's a big sign of that. You know, the normal parts are the little tiny ones that are like, they just like a little toot, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not a smelling, you know, there's no big problems with it. It's just a small little uh, elimination of gas, which is really just sometimes will happen because, you know, the body's starting to move the, the, the fecal mass out of the system, right? Yeah. So that's a normal little part, but it's too smelly. Or, you know, they're too loud, too gassy. Then that, those are problems with gut bacteria and digestion. Okay. Me yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and as a chiropractor, it's interesting, you know, I full time, you know, I'm adjusting people, taking care of patients. And it's not uncommon that, you know, we'll do an adjustment and it's just like, you know, like an explosion happens. <laughs> That's a pressure buildup, poor food, back, whatever it is. It's just like, holy crap. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and well, I can see that because, you know, the digestion is so regulated by the nervous system. This is what I, I always say to all my patients that, you know, digestion isn't about only, you know, breakdown of food, absorption, elimination, but it's actually how we digest our life. So digestion and our, our stools and our gas is all correlated to the amount of stress that we have in our system. And you know, as a chiropractor, that when people are, are unaligned in their life, they're mm -hmm. really stressed out, you know, their spine, their spinal column, and they're, they're, they're not adjusted well, right? It's not stacked properly. Yeah. So then when you adjust it, you reset all those nerves. And then, of course, then the gut is working perfectly, right? So, yeah, it, 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 you know, we are such an amazing ecosystem, our bodies, that if we look at things in a, a, a really smart way and from a global perspective, we can really see all the amazing, you know, functions that are happening simultaneously and that link to the next one. Right? Okay. Super cool. So we, super we have, let's talk, we'll stay in farce before we jump into poop here. But if, if let's say we yeah. have a person that's got these, like, you know, these explosions, these really stinky fart, whatever it may be, that's like the, the poor digestion. Um, what, are there foods they should be focusing on eating? Do they need to do a cleanse? Do they need to, like, what kind of steps would you say they should probably start to take? Like, okay, this is a problem, obviously. You got to do something. Yeah, the first thing that you'd want to see is actually assess their stomach acid levels and see how, how low or high their stomach acid levels are. More than likely, this person is going to have low stomach acid levels. Mm -hmm. So we'd either do what's something called an HCL challenge, which is we basically try titrate them up onto the, H the stomach acid to see how much they can tolerate. Or in other cases, if we don't have the chance to do that, we just start with supplementing with digestive enzymes that have stomach acid, HCL in them, so that now they start to at least break down the protein when they have their food. The other thing we really recommend uh, food combinations to really be careful about mixing fruits with protein or anything sweet with protein because pro uh, protein requires a lot of stomach acid, but fruits really don't. They require an alkaline environment. So what can happen there is that then you set up the body to be confused about what to do with its di digestion. And you can either slow down the protein digestion, which allows more fermentation, which yeah, creates more gas. Okay. Yeah. And then of course, you know, a cleanse always, to me, a cleanse is like, has to be one of the first things people do because when you do a cleanse, you really clear away uh, what you're really not sure about what, when, you're in, in, when you're treating patients because patients will come and I know even ourselves, like when we're looking at our own bodies, like it's like we're a mess of everything, we're, you know, we're one mm -hmm. hot bloody mess, right? Got everything wrong with me. But when you do a cleanse, you can kind of clear that up and you can kind of really see what is exactly the problem and what you really have to target. So I think, and a cleanse, especially within my practice and within the things that I teach uh, always has to do with uh, really resetting the gut bacteria and getting those bowels moving properly so that your bacteria can stay healthy. Got it. Got it. So I was just thinking when you say not mixing, you know, sugars and proteins, like, so I'm mm -hmm. thinking, you know, there's so many people that drink smoothies, like that's become like such a big fad. Like I'll say maybe a good fad, but most people are putting a protein with like, berries and this i mean i know those are lower in the glycemic glycemic index but they're blending all of this stuff together is that like a, a not such a good thing no no really yeah yeah absolutely so yeah and this is a funny thing is that i feel like lots of times in my practice I'm, I'm teaching patients new things because i have such a different perspective of it just having suffered from an irritable bowel and understanding those gassiness and like how to how to really fix it long term mm -hmm. so when your gut is in good shape you really can you shouldn't you should not be doing those fruit smoothies you want to be doing actually more of just a green smoothie so you'd be adding like our typical prescription at our clinic is you know coconut milk like just just out of a can no sugar unsweetened pure coconut deliciousness right which is really more for the fat in it and not yep. necessarily the sugar um high protein uh, maybe a, you know a little quarter of an avocado make it a little bit more creamier and then a big handful of green veggies and then sometimes we'll add things in like nut butter just to give it a different flavor and cocoa powder, nice and simple. And the other thing that we would do is we or to make to change the flavor is that we would do pumpkin uh, puree. So pumpkin puree, okay. a little bit like cinnamon, nutmeg. So they're getting more of a vegetable-based protein smoothie, mm -hmm. high fiber, all the good benefits, but they're not getting the combination of the protein and the sugar. Yeah, is it, Later uh, on. Go ahead. I'm going to interrupt. Well, say later on when their gut gets better, then, you know, they can start to put in the blueberries and those little guys back in the low glycemic fruits. But I honestly, with patients, if their gut, if it has always been a problem for them, they really have to be careful about those combinations because it takes quite a while to re re really reset a gut. And part of that, the most important thing with that is really your diet. 
Okay, that's neat because you you, you mentioned pumpkin. Um, I never thought of me using it, but when uh, our dog is sick, my wife will get by canned pumpkin, and that's yeah. in his food all the time. Yeah, because it's a really yeah, it's a really great fiber. It really helps to like reset the gut. Pumpkin is just. And it's healthy for you as well, too, right? It's got beta carotene. It's got lots of really good nutrients for you. So we love it, like, as part of a way to, like, change up a smoothie and make it a little bit more exciting. Because, you know, people, they do definitely miss the sweet smoothies because that's a big attraction to those, you know, those smoothies. Oh, yeah, but and the sugar the addiction, is, right? Of course, of course. We're yeah. trying to beat all that, right? We're trying to reset the gut, so we got to get that out of the way, right? Yeah. That, that's our, our cool. way to win. Very cool. Yeah. So, so good. Ooh, we got, we got that down. Next, we got to get into the poop. All right. Not, not yes. literally. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be, yeah. I've been no. <laughs> All right. All right. So here we go. Um, so, you know, I, and I, we, we, you're going to give away an infographic on poop. What, what was it called? Yeah. Legends of the throne. The Legends of the throne. That's right. Yeah. So it's basically a, an infographic that shows the different types of poops, right, that people will have because they'll be from everything from large sausages to Smarties to, you know, a wet mess and all. And so I've actually given them all characters and so that you can understand and remember <laughs> what type of school you're doing in the in the bathroom. Yeah, it's a great infographic. For hope, the I Legends hope. of the Throne. Well, so, yeah, I know you're the Queen of Thrones and I'm all I think of is uh... – Game of Thrones at this point, do they? No. <laughs> oh god. I know. Well, oh, I like to say, you know, it's like it's it's appropriate timing for me to be coming out there and uh, telling everyone about poo because you know I get to go off of their fame. Um, but on the infographic, the funny thing is that the Queen of Thrones is is the perfect poop, right? It's an example of the perfect poop, so it's good for people to know. But do you, like, I love that you talked about your dog and the pumpkin. You know why? Because I, when I was first really getting into di- into literally dissecting stools and what what about them and you know what they says about the human body uh-huh. and like trying to find every single resource. You know, one of my best resources was my little dog Lola. Like she was a fantastic resource because I would just watch how she would poo, right? And I'd notice, oh, you know, like she'll eat, she'll go to the bathroom, right? She'll eat, go out to the bathroom. She'll eat. If I feed her twice, she'll go to the bathroom twice. If I feed her, you know, three times, she'll go to the bathroom three times. And then I'd be like, oh, you know, little Lola never wipes her bum ever. She doesn't need to. Oh, she wipes her bum. We have to wipe her bum when she's sick, right? When, when her food's yeah, yeah. not compatible with, right? So I started yeah. really noticing, and you know, nature's our best educator, always. Hands down, you look at nature, you can see everything from it. And then, and then, you know, sure enough, with what I was researching, those were the things that were coming out true was that, you know, you should be, you should ne- never be something called a hyper wiper. So uh, I love, I love that term. When I tell my patients, are you a hyper wiper? They're like, what is a hyper wiper? And I'm like, well, a hyper wiper is someone who wipes more than once. Cause really, you should wipe once and you should wipe clean, really, truly. You should never have any poo on your paper, just like the dog never has oh, to wipe their bum okay. out. Of the house. Yeah. So if you are wiping your bum more than one time, then what happens is you're a hyper wiper, and that could be caused from food sensitivities, um, inflammation that's occurring in the gut, or again, back to bad bacteria and the bad microbiome, right? Those bugs in your mm. gut aren't healthy. So you don't want to be a hyper wiper. You want to wipe once and wipe clean. That's number one. Number two is if you look at the side, like I would look at Lola's little body, like she's a four pound Yorkie. And if I can get her over here, Lola, a four pound Yorkie. And I'd look at the size of her stools comparison to her body. Right. And, and sure enough, like clockwork, like her, the size of her stool would be comparative to like her lower descending colon. Mm-hmm. Right. So our colon, like, right. We got like a little square box and this is say, this is the lower descending colon. Yeah, yeah. That's the food you 24 hours before. And if you if you correlate it on your body, it's actually the so, the length of, from your wrist all the way down to your elbow. So that's your lower descending colon. I'm yep. six foot two. Yep. Holy cow! That's gonna be. <laughs> the, more are, the more you should produce. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and the smaller you are, obviously, you're not gonna have that yeah. much right space yeah, yeah. like to 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 keep it there. You gotta get yeah. it out. So. So that should be your measure every day is that, you know, you're going from your wrist to your elbow. And if you're not, you're not consuming enough water. You're not having enough fiber. You might be missing, you know, you might be low in magnesium. That's another thing that will impact your stools. So those are ways that you can look at it, right? So those are two really important factors. 
Um, then the other factor was, does your, does your, uh, does your stool, your poo sink or float? There's a misconception out there that it should float. And it really shouldn't. What it should do is take a deep dive into the toilet bowl and it should land down and you should not even be able to see it. It's so dense and heavy that it's just like falling down into the like the deep, dark, you know, recesses of the tube (laughs) of the Uh, if it's floating. You know, what happens with a floating stool is that, number one, it's very gassy, right? Because what gas Mm. goes where on water, it goes up. And number two, it is probably full of fat and oil because what does oil do on water? Same it thing. Floats, it floats, yeah. right? Yeah. So you want to have a, a sinker, like a sliding a sliding sinker, like a submarine, right? Going down mm-hmm. to the toilet. You shouldn't even be able to see the whole volume of your stool. It should be like a mysterious surprise, you know? <laughs> and the, ironically, those best stools are the stools where you like sit on the toilet for a second and 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 you like completely evacuate and you feel like, Oh God, that was so awesome. <laughs> and then you get up and like all, all you see is a little tip of it. Cause it's so deep down into the toilet bowl. Those are the best stools. And those, you know, that you've totally produced properly. Um, otherwise there's, there's problems with your stools. So if you're sick, if you're floating, you're either, you know, gassy, bad bacteria, or you're having a problem with your fat digestion. So you may not, you may be either lacking bile or just be una- or you're eating too much fat in your food and you have to watch that balance right okay. so that's another really big important factor yeah do you after that go sorry go ahead, go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm an interrupter go i have i'm okay, cool. thinking of questions it's here. neat awesome so uh the shape is really important too so right because your lower descending colon is like a big tube so ideally i say you know i i, I live in a town where we have like the second biggest Oktoberfest in the world and my opinion is this: it should be like a big Oktoberfest sausage. That's that should be the shape. It should be really like a huge <laughs> jumbo Oktoberfest sausage. I don't know why I correlate all the stools to food, but I do. <laughs> I guess because it's you know it's what we all can relate to, right? It's a universal language, uh, like laughter, right? Yeah, so, totally. So uh, this, yeah, like a big Oktoberfest sausage. That that would be the ideal, you know. Improper sizes or shapes of stool, or you know, when they're coming up like little pebbles or rabbit poo, or I like to call them smarties. You know, when they're coming out of okay. the smarties, then you know you typically are, are low in magnesium because magnesium really helps to have a good good full stool. Uh, that's always a sign of constipation as well too and dehydration. So you want to bring in some more water when you have those little pebbles, and then of course if the stool is too thin. There's a couple of things. If it's been too thin for too long, you really have to go seek medical advice because there could be something, you know, space occupying lesion, something pressing up against your colon and not letting you have a normal stool. But in many cases, and for many women, actually, these small, like uh, thin stools are actually having to do with the amount of stress that we have in our lives. So because we're stressed, our lower sphincter love that word sphincter our lower yeah, yeah. sphincter is is too tight and so when it's too tight what ends up happening is that you literally get a stool that comes out like toothpaste or comes out like a like a small like like spaghetti strand right yeah so that you'll notice change with stressful situations and non-stressful situations mm-hmm. right so those are the other key signs and then of course you know if you're uh you know, a showman in the toilet bowl and you're overly exposing all the food that you ate, right? So all you <laughs> look at the toilet, right? And you see all the food you ate the day before. Well, clearly there you have a problem and, and you typically tend to be that person who, you know, has problems all along the digestion, like digestive enzymes, a whole bunch of issues. HCL is an issue. Green stools, as a side note, is because, not because you're uh, having too many green smoothies, although you'll often see that, it ends up being because of a lack of stomach acid, HCL, and you'll have more green stools. Oh, interesting. Because what you need is, that acid. yeah, that acid will turn the chlorophyll in all your green foods into brown as well, too. So then that'll that'll change it. Yeah. Me, they, there's so yeah. many things. I could go on, well, on, it, and on. Does, <laughs> you said being a showman, all I could think of is fat bastard going, I don't remember eating any corn. <laughs> That's just dying yeah. laughing. I'm like, oh. in my head, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Right. I love it. I love life's a shit show. Yeah, is what I yeah. like to say <laughs> truly like it tells you so much about your state of, of well-being and like your yeah. digestion is how you digest. Life, right. So if you if you're digesting life well and, you know, things are going great, then your stools are going to be beautiful. And your digestion is going to be great. Easy, easy equation on that one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking about, you know, I I'm a, have a very active lifestyle. I, you know, I hang around a lot of people that are very active, whether it's CrossFit or running or skiing or not, whatever it may be. Um, 
do those stressors that we like kind of put on ourselves like physically, not that they're bad, like like yeah. exercise, do that have will that affect how you go to the bathroom? Will it affect the way you digest, you know, and, and all of the, the stuff that we're talking about? Absolutely. So as an example, uh, there's a couple of things I can correlate. So lots of times athletic people or people are biohacking or going to things like ketogenic diets mm-hmm. and such. And those are notorious for making people constipated, right? Just because of the the mixture of foods and such. And so if you want to do a ketogenic diet, you have to do it a little bit cleaner than a normal ketogenic diet in order to maintain those healthy stools. And just for long-term health and longevity, I mean, you need to have still carbohydrates. You can't totally restrict those. You need to have more greens. You need more of the fibers to kind of compensate for that. Mm. That's one thing. Um, athletes are known, especially those who are doing for those marathons. And I know how you just you just finished, uh, yeah, what did ultra, you do, an ultimate? Yeah, yeah, 50, yeah. A 50K trail run. Yes. Awesome. Congratulations. So uh, what happens with those types of events is that it's an incredible, strenuous uh, stress on the system. And and athletes, including Olympians, have been known to get what's called Jumanji guts at the end of their uh, athletic event. And that's basically like a full-on diarrhea and evacuation, or it might have happened even sometimes in between of uh, the course. I don't know if you mm-hmm. experienced that, but Jumanji guts. And it's basically Jumanji just like the gut, gut is stressed out and it's okay. like boom and it just like it's got a big explosion and everything eliminates right because the body is trying to also deal with the acidity levels within the tissues right because yeah. your lactic acid is built up as you're as you're training and as you're you're exercising to such an ex, ex, uh, high elite level right the, and then the body the gut is what w- works to regulate the acid levels within the within the tissues as well too so then that's why you'll have a, an experience like a jumanji gut yeah. cool eh yeah it's, yeah, it's interesting. It was I know during during my run or the, this race that I did, there was you know that I brought you know I had like algae with me, like that's those were like my energy things. I had like nut butters yeah. and you know some high calorie foods for healthier foods, you know whatever it was, pro bars. But you know we go to these aid stations and thank God we had like all natural. They're into organic stuff at these these races, which is neat. But like electrolytes. But they also had like peanut butter and jelly, like in like Doritos and Cheetos. I'm like, really? That's it's going to kill you like in more than one way. Right. And I'm just thinking like, what are these guys? I'm going to have to run behind one of these people. It's going to be like have like diarrhea while they're like mid run because they're eating cheese, Cheetos or cheese its or whatever the hell they were eating. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you can't, if you're an elite, elite athlete, there's no way that you can be consuming those types of foods because what's going to happen is you're just going to, yeah, you're just going to stress your gut more, right? And and you got to think, you're you're not stopping and taking a break or a pause to eating. Like, you're, you're still going actively, yeah. right? Like, digestion is all about, you know, sitting down, relaxing, you know, switching your body into the parasympathetic relaxed state. And then you have right? Like better balance and everything works better. Right. So you guys, you definitely, you guys strain your guts when you, de- when you do these elite uh, events. But I mean, to me, I don't think you should stop them because I feel it's part of uh, what you want to achieve in your life. But I just think you need to, you want to learn how to better balance yes. it. Right. Just to make sure how, you, right. Yeah. So how do you the, figure out those times? Yeah. There's the, there's the doggy. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get, let me get her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, Josh. Let me see if I can get Lola. And then, Jesse, can you bring me Lola? <laughs> the little. This is a little pooper that you're that gave me all the inspiration. See, look at how tiny she is. Oh, yeah. Right, she's four pounds. So, like her little intestine is that small, right? And yeah. so that's how she would. Uh, that's how I learned about that. Uh, nature is the best educator, right? Yeah. Awesome. So, so then here's here's a, a digestion endurance question. You know, for me, like we're yeah. planning, I'm planning, I'm probably going to do one or two of these events a year. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, very I'm a ketogenic, but like a lot of greens, like I probably eat mostly greens. Um, yeah. But I do have my proteins. And I like that last week, I wasn't eating like flesh or very, ate very little flesh that last week because I know it's the hardest thing in the world to digest, especially – you know, if I'm going to be running yeah. for seven or eight hours. Um, so like what type of foods like would you recommend maybe like, but I can't, I can't do like the pot. I can't do like the traditional pasta. That That's a no, no for me. Like that just kills me. And I don't want to take a nap, but like, pr- like either pre-run or yeah, pre-run and like during like an endurance event, like what kind of foods would be like easy uh, for the digestive system, you know, in a sense, if you got to have something in your system. 
Yeah, I love, I mean, I like nut butters. I'm a big fan of nut butters. They're so packed full of everything. Those are probably some of the better ones. Um, and to not forget about the squashes, honestly, like the pumpkin and the zucchini and to make like pu- purees and put them into packs. If you can do things like that, like I have a couple of patients who are elite trainers and that's what they use as their like their instant food. Right. And sometimes okay. you have to, also, you also have to think that, I mean, you you need a lot of sugar when you're, do- when you're doing these, these events and yeah. you do need to take some of the, like the mixed gels and stuff. And although, you know, they're, they're fructose and it I use matter. Honey. You need I use that. the honey. The amount of- yeah. yeah. Oh, so using, even better. Yeah. I love so that. I'm using that for the, the direct injection of sugar and like vitamin B and all that stuff. Um, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Honey would be ideal or syrup or something like I, I even like maple syrup over honey because maple syrup has more minerals in it, magnesium and such. So during your run, it could help you kind of get through and push you a little oh, Okay. I'll do that. Our, right. our friend makes it. So yeah. right from their yard. Oh, oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So we get, we get it like, we get, like the real deal. I'm, I know up there you guys obviously do. But I don't have to pay for it, which is even better. Yeah. There <laughs> you go. Uh, even better. <laughs> okay. So that's good. So so we have maple syrup. We have like like pumpkin. What other – you said other squashes? Like I mean if I just like – Any of the – like the spaghetti squashes are great foods you could be eating leading up to it just because of the carbohydrate content as well too. Uh-huh. So it will help you – to like build your, your glycogen stores. The other thing that I really love is quinoa. Quinoa is one of our staples and amaranth as grains, just to be okay. consuming a lot of those. Cause they tend to, they're actually not even grains they are more seeds. So they tend to get more protein and higher fat and they're, they're, okay. they're more for sustenance. Yeah. yeah. So My, those would be the, that we would recommend. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm pretty like, uh, since I haven't really been doing a lot of grain for the probably the past, like five, six, seven years grain. Like once I put it in my system, my body goes like, Holy crap. Like, what did you just put in your body? Even, even quinoa and amaranth? I haven't tried amaranth. Quinoa, it depends. It depends on how, because I, you know, if I, I, I like eating. So if I, if I have a sit, if I sit down with like a thing, I'm like, okay, like, I can keep going. It doesn't feel like anything to yeah. me. So I, I really haven't yeah, tested yeah. like normal human portions in a while. Ah. Love it. That could be it, right? Is that you just need to have the, yeah, smaller portion. I, I, although I have to say, I eat like that as well too. Like I am, like I, I fast throughout the evening, and then in the morning I do a sixteen eight, and then I eat my two meals of the day. But those meals are big, right? Like I, I make sure I, I, I get my calories in those, in those times, right? Okay. But for a lot of people, they can't consume that amount of food in in that period of time. So then they just they they tend to when we say at least try to eat within an eight hour period. That should be your feeding yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I intermittent fast yeah. as well. Uh, but you do the morning. You you fast for the evening. Is that what you just said? You yeah. Did? Well, just like yeah, past eight p.m. Right. So then we we just all we say is this is like you need. I I want a sixteen hour a period of time where I don't eat, um, because that also is incredibly good, of course, as a biohacking technique, but more so for the gut and for cleansing mechanisms. Because yeah. when you when you when you eat, you stop cleansing. So, and your body is not focused on, uh, you know, peristalsis, which is like the movement that the bowels make in order to get the stools mm-hmm. out of your body. So all that helps when you eat. So that's why we want 16 hours clear of food. And the easiest way to do that is if you, you know, stop eating dinner at, or food after seven or eight at night, and then you just over o- the overnight period, you just, you, you don't eat. And then that's cause you're sleeping. So no big deal. And then when you wake up in the morning, I say drink green tea as much as you can, at least three to four cups of green tea. Because that green tea, number one, uh, will help improve your ketogenesis and your, your ketosis. Um, what it also does, green tea, is green tea is amazing to help with healing of the gut lining. And it's a natural antibacterial and a natural resetter of the microbiome. Green tea, cheap. Like it's, and yeah. I mean, get good quality, though. You just get a state, like not necessarily from China. You want a state, an estate tea, organic. And uh, as much green tea as you can in the morning. And that also helps with cleaning up the mess that was left from your overnight detox and cleansing, right? Oh, so that's how cool. we always recommend. Yeah, and then eat somewhere around uh, 12, new 11 or 12, and then within an eight-hour period, that's your feeding time, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so our that's Here's our another time. question. I intermittent yeah. fast, and I've, I've learned so many so many different t- or tactics or techniques that people use to, for, for these similar reasons. So I, I'm not a snacker. I used to be, but I, I tend not to be like snacking like in that eight hours. I'll eat like something like, it was, I'm usually in practice or doing something. So I'll have salad, you know, high fat oils and all nuts and all whatever's on it. 
And then I won't eat again until I get home, which is usually like 7, 7 30, 8 15, something like that. Then I eat and then I'm done. Like, do you, are yeah. you eating that whole eight hours? You kind of like snacking and going through your day? So I think it depends on the day. Like, if I'm so at, at clinic, I'm really, really busy. And I think I'm, I know my brain is really metabolizing and going super fast. And I, I get a lot hungrier. So I find that clinic, I'm, I'm, I'm munching throughout the entire evening. But otherwise, no. Otherwise, I find that I'm just doing one meal and then one meal and I just leave it. I'd rather ha- I'd rather sit down and make uh, – and I think this is important for a lot of us to appreciate is that I would rather sit down and, you know, make a nice environment to eat in instead of eating mm-hmm. on the go. I want to ha- sit down and have a good meal, have a good conversation with people I love and care about. You know, that's to me very, very important. So that's what I like to try to make the meal time as something as like a, a ritual that should be, you know, honored because we live in a fast paced society. And why can we not give ourselves time to nourish our beautiful temples? Right. Yeah, totally. Why not? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. This is, a, this is a good conversation. This is going a lot of really good directions. I like this. So I want to also <laughs> mention this, that you are you have a book called Gut Feelings that we're, it's an ebook, yeah. which, which we're going to give away. Yeah as well so you're gonna get all the details you have to listen to the end through the whole podcast here everybody you got to get to all the way to the end which is not going to be much longer but you have to get to the end and then you're gonna get all the details um but tell us a little bit about you know gut feelings like what is it what are people yeah. going to get out of that so, book it's actually like a lot of the things that we've talked about today it's it's a, a synopsis in about 28 pages so if you're really into getting your gut uh, fix it's not like an uber long book but it's a good enough book that it gives you all the details like the three the three most important factors about your stools, about your, your farts, and then about, you know, the mood that you have that is creating and affecting uh, your guts. And that's why it's called gut feelings, because people think that the gut is like a standalone, you know, it's just like an organ system that we have to fix. But part of fixing your guts actually has to do with dealing with your anxiety and your stress. And if you don't deal with that anxiety and stress and depression and the mood changes that you have, you, you, you can't get your guts totally like 100%. Right. Because it's uh, it's so intertwined. The gut is like the biggest hub of your hormones, your nervous system, uh, your everything, your immune system. Right. So it's a hub, the central, you know, central station, like in New York City. Right. Yeah. Everything goes there. If, if, if you don't if you don't address the other parts of that, of that, that system and most specifically the nervous system, because the nervous system drives the gut. You, you won't be able to get the gut better. So that's the, the final finale to it. And in Gut Feelings, we also talk about the supplements you should be taking to fix your gut, mm-hmm. um, how to pick good supplements, your sleep routine, your your fasting methods, like all these things that we've covered is what we talk about because it, those are the important key factors. And, and, and the secret sauce that I found in my practice and with my patients and what my online program and different things that I'm working on now uh, are about is about that, that aspect of anxiety and the depression and the mood and how we address that and the stress that's on our bodies constantly to reset it so that our guts can be can flourish because I feel if your gut is good you will find your grace and you will know like what your main purpose is in life like why you're here what you need to do because you'll you'll be in tune right you'll be totally in tune with what you need to be doing in your lifetime here oh it's so cool it's it's big picture I like that's like a 50,000 foot view of life right so yeah yeah well true yeah yeah so what where's the best place to people where people can actually find you besides actually going to your practice but where can where can they find you online yeah so i'm moving to more of an online platform now for the main purpose that in clinical practice i'm i'm i i I love clinical practice i'll never give that up but i can only help one person at a time right and i know my message is big and it's important and none of the people are speaking about it and i know i'm the best to deliver it so online on my website www.doctor so that's d r marisol m a r i s o l dot com and there you can find uh links to you know pre-purchasing my book links to my program the movement or an, uh, which is basically uh you know a reset of your gut and how to get your your bowels moving mm. right the movement yeah, and then uh, Fit for a Queen, which is another online program I have that I talk about uh, tools and specifically something called the Castor Oil Pack for gut health. So really, my main focus is how we can get that gut improving uh, for ultimate health and getting those bowels as our barometer uh, for our overall health and what what it's telling about us, and so that we can you know be our own best doctor because truly, you or me or you know your best friend or anyone that you know should be able to like go have a bowel movement and be like, okay. 
I'm deficient on HCL, digestive enzymes, my gut bacteria is not doing too well, it's time for a cleanse, I need to start doing these things. And that's that's how I want to empower people because I believe that is within our grasp. We can do that. Of course, it'll never replace a practitioner. You will need to have a practitioner as a guide, but it's such a great start. And if, you, if, if I had patients come to me with all this background information that I'm teaching out there now, Wow, my job would be easy. I would just have to really direct them in the the the, the finesse of what they need, but really they would have the majority majority of it like under undercover done. You know, it'd be it'd be figured out for them. So yeah. that's that's my goal. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. education and or I shouldn't even say education, just understanding like basics is so key in, in all areas of lifestyle. And um so I'm grateful that we had you on to to talk about farting and pooping and tooting and all the above and uh so I want to thank you, you know, for being on Lifestyle Locker Radio. This has been an awesome, absolutely awesome conversation. I'm sure we will stay connected and we will probably have to talk more about farting and pooping because I'm sure this is going to get a lot, a lot of listens and a lot of downloads. So thank you so awesome. much. Thank you, Dr. Josh. It's been a pleasure. And anytime, I'll, my whole mission is I want everyone to own their throne. So let's let's get doing that. <laughs> totally. Perfect. Locker Nation, how do you like Dr. Marisol on farting and pooping? Hope you enjoyed that one. She is a a brain when it comes to the gut. You know, we're constantly talking about what we're putting in our body, the nutrients, nutrition, which is super, super important. We also need to make sure that we're eliminating things the correct way, whether it be via gas or poop, right? But also, she said something that's really important is that our central nervous system dictates your function of your digestive tract, which is super important for me as a chiropractor is that you can help the digestion by getting adjusted, but then you need to feed it and fuel it the right way like Dr. Marisol is talking about so it can have all the nutrients get absorbed and then be eliminated the right way. So you're going to get two things from Dr. Marisol. Make sure you do check in the show notes or on lifestylelocker.com forward slash Marisol Tejero. Just make sure you just look in the show notes if you have a hard time spelling that because I know I did. But you're going to get two things. You're going to get the Legends of the Throne infographic and you're also going to get the ebook Gut Feelings. All right, Locker Nation. Have an awesome day, evening, night, wherever you are listening and Peace out.